thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to uh, be here. Uh, I first became aware of Nob uh, with a, a friend of mine who was a member uh, here at St. Augustine, and uh, I would pick up some of his magazines. This man was crazy about flags. Uh, and um, uh, I gave Amber a lot of his flag collection. He had lots of miniature flags, but he also had large scale ones. And he would, he would uh, put them out at the bottom of the hat. There'd be some loose flag in his, his, his yard. Anyway, um, a lot of the flags that I'm going to show you, you will be very familiar with. So I'm not going to describe the history of that flag, but they are images unique to St. Augustine. And um, the first one is uh, the French. Uh, if French. St. Augustine, uh, this is heresy. Uh, we're Spanish, but no, 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 the French here were first. Uh, in uh, 1562, they came sailing by Jean Nouveau and uh, landed at St. Augustine Beach. Uh, so this is the St. Augustine Inlet, which they, this map is in Latin. So it's Fluvin Delphinum, the river of dolphins. And this cape there is Promatorium Gallicum, uh, or French uh, cape. Uh, and we, we have uh, another picture. Well, this is a close-up a few days later. But the French were great. They were an artist with them. Jacques Lamont de uh, And so here is uh, Rouleau's flagship. Uh, and um, I don't know what that flag is. And I have asked uh, Jane McGrath, who is the leading uh, living authority on the French in early Florida, uh, and he doesn't know what that flag is. So if any of you can figure out whether that was uh, his personal standard or just something that was put there uh, due to artistic license, we don't know. But uh, the French then came back in 1564 and established uh, Fort Caroline uh, at the mouth of the St. John's River. And uh, Jacques Le Wendel Award's image of Fort Caroline you see the famous um, French uh, royal fleur de lis uh, flag there. So the first European flags uh, used in Northeast Florida uh, were French. Then our next images of the area come from uh, this view by uh, uh, Baptiste Bellasio which uh, was published shortly after Sir Francis Drake's attack in 1586. It is the earliest view of any North American city. And here is a close-up of it. So you can see the English with the cross of St. George. Uh, and over here on the Spanish fort, you have the Burgundian Saltair, uh, which was the uh, insignia used uh, through the Habsburg dynasty and into the 18th century, they were still using it up until uh, 1786 when the Spanish uh, changed their national flag. And here is another image of, of, from this series of images that were done to illustrate Sir Francis Drake's uh, voyage around the uh, Caribbean, where he ended up not only in St. Augustine, but he also took some people from the Roanoke colony uh, in uh, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, there you see uh, some close up. Uh, here you have the cross of St. George, and here you have the royal standard with the uh, fleurly, the French flag quartered with the English uh, lions uh, on the red background. So our next good image of flags comes from another attack. When uh, James Oglethorpe, the founder of Georgia, came down and attacked St. Augustine in 1740. So uh, here's the whole image, which was published in a gentleman's magazine, uh, which is the earliest magazine in the world. Uh, and um, there's this wonderful descriptive key, and here's a close-up of the ships so that you see uh, typical Cross of St. George, Red Ensign, um, so various flags that, that anybody who studies uh, British flags are very conversant with. At the 
Two years later, Oglethorpe came back and uh, somebody on his staff sketched Fort Matanzas, which uh, this was kind of a spying expedition. They landed up in the Bonavita Beach area, uh, and, uh, but they didn't attack San Juan because there was too much illness in their uh, troops. So they turned around and went back to Savannah. Uh, but here we have the Gummy and Saltair flying off Fort Matanzas. This is our earliest view of Fort Matanzas from 1742, uh, uh, showing uh, what the fort looked like and what flag the Spanish were flying. Uh, now, in, in 1763, the British gained control of Florida uh, due to the end of the Seven Years' War. The British had captured Havana, and in, in order to get Havana Cuba back, and the treaty specified that the Brits would get Florida. Uh, so it becomes a Florida possession. And here again, on uh, the governor's uh, mansion, uh, on our main plaza, this uh, portions of this building are still standing. You have, again, the red ensign flying uh, off the house. You know, we think of the red ensign as being strictly a nautical uh, thing, but I think they used the flags they had available. Uh, but this is a 1764 uh, watercolor that's in the British Museum. Now, as I said, they changed the flag in 1786, the Spanish did. The Spanish returned because the Spanish were allies of uh, the revolutionaries during the American Revolution. They had actually captured Pensacola and the rest of West Florida. Uh, so at the end of the American Revolution, Florida again is again Spanish. Uh, and uh, just a couple of years later, they decide that the uh, Burgundian Saltair on the white background was uh, not recognizable enough at a distance for the ships. And so the familiar uh, uh, red and gold stripes, which are still on the uh, Spanish flag today, uh, were instituted. But the coat of arms on the Spanish flag was a very much simplified version of the Spanish coat of arms. If you go to a Spanish flag today, it's a much more complex coat of arms, but you have the Lions of Leon and the Castle of Castile. And this is a picture of Fort San Nicolas, which was uh, guarding the south side of the Cal Fort, which we now call Jacksonville. Now, during the Second Spanish period, there were uh, various units of the Spanish army stationed here, and we're lucky to from uh, other sources uh, to know what some of their regimental uh, batters look like. Uh, so the uh, infantry regiment of Havana was stationed here for quite some time. And so there's a standard pattern to these um, regimental uh, Spanish flags in that you have the Burgundian Saltair, the Royal Arms, and then the coat of arms of the city uh, where the uh, soldiers were from on the ends of the Saltair. So the, the three castles on a white background is, uh, is still the uh, component of the coat of arms of the city of Havana today. And one of the units we had here uh, were the uh, a unit of free blacks from uh, Havana. Uh, and so this is the Italian de Moreno's uh, Libre de la Havana. And that's their motto, uh, victory or death. But then Florida becomes American territory in 1821. And this is a somewhat fictive painting of the transfer of flags. We have very good descriptions of how the, the ceremony uh, with uh, lowering the Spanish flag and raising the Spanish, uh, the American flag occurred uh, uh, at the Casino de San Marcos. Uh, so it was very much a flag ceremony. Uh, this painting was done in the 1940s uh, by James Albert Smith, a local uh, St. Augustine artist. Uh, it's pretty obvious he was a magazine illustrator for much of his life. And you see the Marine Corps flag uh, there as well. Now, when it comes to the Civil War, uh, I, I know that Roger Smith is, uh, is going to talk to uh, some extent about that. Uh, but our local militia unit, which had been formed before the Civil War, was called the St. Augustine Blues. 
uh, and it becomes part of the second floor of infantry and the Confederate Army. And this was uh, their flag. Uh, any faithful submission and the number of st uh, stars of the con uh, Confederate states. Now, flags have played a role in a lot of St. Augustine's civic festivals and events. And we used to have this fantastic pageant every spring called the Pasta Leon Festival. It was very commercial. It was designed around Palm Sunday, Easter time, to get our winter visitors. Remember, in this time period, in the 1890s, 1910s, and 20s, um, Florida was only a winter resort. There was no summer tourism. You wanted to get the hell out of Dodge in the summer because of the dogs. But the, they had uh, almost week long series of events. Each day would have a different theme. Oh, this is going to be the Spanish landing theme. This is going to be the American Revolution theme, uh, et cetera. And so they would have these tremendous flag displays for the Pasta Leon Festival uh, here in St. Augustine. Uh, and um, uh, then more recent festivals starting right after World War II. St. Augustine had a major fishing industry, especially shrimp. Uh, we built more tr uh, shrimp trawlers. Uh, the, the commercial fishing trawler was pretty much invented in St. Augustine, just around the corner here uh, on Riberia Street. Uh, and so the blessing of the fleet every Palm uh, Sunday, which we still have, um, uh, there were lots of flags on the ships. Uh, it is now virtually entirely pleasure yachts, uh, but um, when it was originally started right after World War II, it was largely commercial vessels. Uh, and then we do various reenactments. So here is a reenactment of uh, the landing of Juan Ponce de Leon uh, with the uh, flag of uh, Ferdinand and Isabella time period. Uh, you know, it's a little controversy as to whether Juan Ponce de Leon in, in 1513 actually landed around here. Uh, because the earliest account of it uh, by uh, Juan de Herrera was written 40 years later. And it sounds like he had access to a ship's log, but no one's been able to find that log. And he places the landing point just north of St. Augustine. But there's a number of historians who, would, for very good reasons, debate that, uh, that they think it actually landed closer to Melbourne. So you have. Um, uh, a different cities uh, vying for the, the point of honor of the Ponce de Leon landing and spreading disease. I work for the St. Augustine Historical Society. We're the oldest continuously operating historical society in the state of Florida. We were established in 1883. And in 1918, we bought the oldest house in town, which had already been, been run as a, a tourist attraction, at least during the winter months, by its previous owners. Uh, and um, the first manager uh, that the historical society hired uh, to run uh, the oldest house is the house museum. This is 1918. This is one of the earliest house museums in the country, let alone the first in the state. So this was a, a, a novel concept to have a museum house. I mean, there's only a couple that are earlier, like Mount Vernon and, and Paul Revere's house. Um, but our first manager to draw attention to the house put up a panoply of flags of countries that had, had ruled uh, over Florida. And this kind of changed from time to time. So you only see a very weird Spanish flag. I don't know where you got that idea. Uh, you find the 20th century British flag and then the uh, US flag. Yes, you have a question? I think that Spanish flag was the civil ensign or merchant flag of Spain of oh, 1785 and 1920 something. Yeah, that, that could be. The, um, uh, but then uh, 20 years later, you have the American flag, the Confederate flag, the British flag, uh, and a better version of the Spanish flag, a more authentic one. Uh, this is what we fly today. We are no longer flying the um, Confederate battle flag. We have the first national Confederate flag and a simple banner of the uh, 
the um, Spanish colors, and we also fly the first Spanish period flag, the Burgundian Saltair. Uh, so um, it shows how our awareness of flags through history have changed over time at the historical society and how it's presented to the public. Uh, now, uh, the first flag of the city of St. Augustine was an idea of this guy, Dr. Anderson. Uh, you're sitting in his parlor. Uh, he was a great promoter of St. Augustine. He'd grown up here. Uh, uh, his mother built this house, uh, at least this half of it. The other half he built. Uh, but anyway, uh, there was a local uh, artist, C. Adrian Pillars, who until very recently had the distinction of being uh, the, the only artist with two statues in Statuary Hall that he, he sculpted, but once been removed. Uh, but there's one local artist still there, the one of Dr. Gore. But anyway, so he contacted the local artist, said, oh, well, the city needs a flag to use for all these festivals, like the Constitution Festival. And so we have the Spanish colors with a black silhouette of the Spanish world coat of arms, uh, patterned after the, the coat of arms that is over the main entrance to the Castilla de San Marco. Now, that flag went out of popularity. I don't know why. Uh, so in 1953, the city adopted this flag designed by the city clerk. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and so you have a, uh, a light gold background with the royal arms of Spain and the centers uh, on this red uh, rondelle. Uh, these are the current flags. I was involved with the city of St. Augustine getting an authentic coat of arms for itself um, back in 1991 uh, so that we would have a, a flag uh, granted by the King of Spain, or an arms granted by the King of Spain uh, for the 500th anniversary of Columbus's uh, voyage. Uh, so, um, so here's the current uh, city uh, flag, which is very much based on Pauline Boyd's design, with the coat of arms now being the actual coat of arms of the city of St. Augustine, which was originally petitioned for in 1716, but never granted. We reactivated that petition, and then it was granted by King uh, Juan Carlos I. Uh, and then this is the flag that, according to their website, is the flag of St. John's County, which also got a new coat of arms with the uh, uh, Lamb of St. John, uh, the, uh, the Baptist, uh, as part of it. But you go out to the county courthouse, I don't know if they cheat that or what. I do not know why, but you find it on just a white background, not with the uh, greenish blue uh, waves. So I don't know why there are two. Uh, that's, yes, that's the end of my project. So um, anyway, I just wanted to show you uh, in St. Augustine. I hope some of those images are new to you. So, been a pleasure. Thank you very much.